I'm Melissa Nasia, and I'm the History Collections Librarian. This presentation is sponsored by the Lopez Library History Collections and the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. If you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance sheet. Uh, we have several more presentations scheduled for this season. So on Monday, September 28th, TB or not TB, The Reemerging White Plague Through History with John M. Lehman, PhD, and Bobby Collins, GDS, MS. Then on Monday, October 26th, The History of Amputation with Carolyn Horn, uh, PhD, MSN, RNBC. On Monday, November 9th, Dr. Anton Chekhov and the Syphilitics of Sakhalin Island with John Papalis, MD. Today's presentation is Disease and Doctoring in Montana at the Dawn of Modern Medicine, 1880 to 1915. Our presenter is Todd L. Savitt, PhD, Professor of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies at the Brody School of Medicine. Todd has been at ECU for about 33 years. As you can see, our current exhibit uh, just arrived. It's a new traveling exhibit from the National Library of Medicine titled A Voyage to Health. And it's about the revival of, of native Hawaiian traditions. So here's Todd Savitt to speak on disease and doctoring in Montana at the dawn, dawn of modern medicine, 1880 to 1915. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I think you'll find this a fun talk. Um, and I think you'll, I'm hoping you'll learn something from it as well. Um, a couple of things I need to start with. Number one, my head. My head is red right now. Um, and rather than um, uh, have you puzzling about it, I'm using some medication on my head for some uh, actino keratoses that I have, and so um, it looks pretty ugly, people have said. So I'm admitting it and uh, letting you know that I know it's there, and it's okay to stare. We can't see it. You can't see it. That's because it's so dark. Even when I go like that, you can't see it. I'm very aware of it. <laughs> Secondly, why am I giving a talk on Montana in eastern North Carolina? So just to um, give you a little bit of background about this. Um, back in 1994, I had the opportunity to serve as a visiting professor at the University of Montana in Missoula. And uh, I had been to Montana once or twice before then and loved that place. It's probably, Montana is probably my favorite place in the world. Um, at least as much of the world as I've seen so far in my life. And I vowed that I would find ways to go out there as much as I could. And one way to do that was to do research on history of medicine in Montana, since I'm a historian of medicine. So um, that's an unabashed reason for doing this. But it's also, um, I've published a few articles on Montana medical history, and I'm working on uh, making this into an article as well, what I'm going to present to you today. So um, I will assume not much knowledge about Montana, but feel free to interrupt if I don't give you enough information about the places that I'm talking about and you want to know more. So imagine that it's 100 or so years ago actually a little bit more than that. And you've gone to medical school and have graduated from medical school. And you live in the east of the US or the Midwest of the US. What's your next adventure? What are you going to do next now? Where do you want to go to practice? What's it like in that place where you're thinking about going? Can I make a living doing it in that place? All questions of a young practitioner. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. 
I'm going to talk about medicine in Montana about a hundred or so years ago. I'm going to talk first about opening a medical practice in Missoula, Montana, and then about practicing medicine in Montana, and that'll be in another part of the state called the Madison Valley. And then I'll talk very briefly, because I don't have that much time, um, about the medical profession. Be how, does, how does medicine become professionalized in a new place like Montana uh, back at that time period? And I should say that Montana was first um, discovered, so to speak, by whites in the 1860s when gold was discovered uh, in a couple of places there. And it became a territory, part of Idaho, part of Washington State, then Idaho, and then a territory on its own, and became a state in 1889. Um, so it was a new state in 1900 or so to 1915. Um, so I've drawn my talk today on three small collections of uh, papers. One at the University of Montana, um, the John Gettys Randall papers, and I'll say a lot more about Randall. And then um, two small collections at the Montana Historical Society in Helena, the capital city of Montana. Um, and those are the McNulty Papers and the Fergus County Medical Society. And then I'm also drawing this for this talk on my own knowledge of the history of medicine to try to give you some perspective um, on this so it's not a provincial talk but puts it in the larger context. So, part one. Moving to and opening a practice in Missoula in uh, 1905, and the star is John Geddes Randall. His years, 1873 to 1940. He was born in Michigan and grew up uh, in Michigan, but mostly in Wisconsin, and specifically in Beloit, Wisconsin. Um, we don't have, do we have a pointer? No pointer. Goodness. Okay, I'm going to, forgive me, um, uh, CW, I'm going to walk away from there for a second. So here's Beloit, okay, here's Milwaukee, Chicago is down, this is Lake Michigan, so Chicago's down here, that'll play a role in this story, and most of Wisconsin is, is further north. There's the capital, Madison, I never put it together, Madison, and the town that Randall settled in was Monroe, and I never thought about it. Presidents, Madison, Monroe, you know, kind of interesting. Okay, so um, John Geddes Randall uh, grew up in Beloit, right on the border with Illinois, went to college there at Beloit College. And here, actually, was a, I wrote to the archivist there, and he sent me pictures of this guy. The only pictures I have, I don't know if you'd call him a handsome devil or... Uh, <laughs> but he certainly liked to strike a pose. Uh, so this is, this is John Geddes Randall, uh, and I have a picture from his obituary back, uh, later in 1940, but it didn't reproduce, so that's the best I could do. He'd always wanted to be a physician, it appears from uh, evidence, internal evidence, and went to medical school at Hahnemann Medical College in Chicago graduated in 1898. Hahnemann was a homeopathic school, and the more, more famous Hahnemann Medical College uh, was in Philadelphia, and it merged and be, it became part of, um, um, what's the name of the school now? Drexel, that and Women's Medical College. So Drexel is now uh, what was once Hahnemann Medical College. And I won't go into home, uh, stories about homeopathy, but it was a, a competitor with regular medicine at this time in 1900, uh, a strong competitor with regular medicine. So this is a picture of Hahnemann Hospital and of um, 
the medical school that I got off the web. Um, so he graduated from there in 1898 and then moved to Monroe, Wisconsin, about 35 miles from home. He was a homebody. Um, we have a, a few of the eight letters that I found in this little collection in Missoula um, indicate that he was a, a homebody. One letter is Dear Mama. This is a guy who's 30 years old or so. Um, and um, apparently at some point in the several years between 1898 when he moved to Monroe and 1905, he started getting a little bit restless uh, for something new and different. And so he wrote a letter to his mother in late July or early August of 1905. The letter isn't exactly dated. Um, the opportunity had arisen to, for him to move out west. So here's Monroe, okay, and there's Montana. And Missoula is way over in the western part of Montana. So a couple of states over from where he was living. So this is what he writes to Mama. Things are the same here as usual, and practice is rather slow just now. But I have wore out here, and so I am ready to leave. Um, there's more to the letter, and I'll give you a little bit more in a minute. He was still young in his career and was a little reluctant to leave before proving himself to his more experienced colleagues and to his patients. But he convinced himself to do it, as he explained to his mother. <coughs> I did hate to leave Monroe before I had shown them, that is his medical colleagues, what I could do. But now, so he arrived in 98 and this is 05, so it's been seven years approximately. But now, as everyone is saying, yes, he is a good doctor, I am satisfied. And actually came across, I've been doing some microfilm reading the last couple of weeks here in, in the local Monroe, Wisconsin newspaper and found um, uh, sort of editorial boxes that said goodbye to Dr. Randall, we really love your practice here. We're sorry to see you go, but good luck as you move on to your new uh, place out in Montana. So what is it that precipitated this sudden move? It was a letter from a friend of his, this guy right here, young looking, because he's 25 um, approximately, and um, Randall is about 30, so uh, he's actually a little bit younger. This guy was Presbyterian minister who had just moved from, it turns out, Monroe or Chicago. He had just graduated from seminary um, and had filled in as a student, it appears, student minister in Monroe. He moved out to his first uh, job in Missoula, and he loved it, and apparently the two of them, this guy's name is Ernest Wright, and Randall had gotten to know each other while this, the minister was a student minister in the little town of Monroe. And so um, he said that he had found an opportunity for him. So what was it that he found? He found out that a, another doctor, a homeopathic doctor in Missoula, had decided to leave and move to Seattle, to the big city, to get, a, get involved in a bigger practice. And so he wanted to sell his practice in Missoula. And so Wright said, I got a, the perfect guy for you, and wrote to uh, Randall and said, you got to move out here and join me. Randall had all kinds of questions about the practice, what do I need to open it, What's Missoula like, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, there's Montana. So just step back for a sec and give you a little bit of a picture of what's going on in medicine at this time. The turn of the 20th century was an exciting time in medicine. Um, the early, I'm uh, sorry, the latter part of the, ninth, of the 1800s was the time when germs were discovered 
Pasteur had done his work. Lister was discovering antisepsis. Um, uh, Robert Koch had de de described how you could decide whether a germ was a cause of the disease. So bacteria were being named after famous people, after discoverers. Um, physical diagnosis, the use of the various tools that we use today in physical diagnosis were being perfected, including the stethoscope and percussion and uh, the uh, a sphygmomanometer for blood pressure, et cetera. I've mentioned antisepsis. Um, hospitals were becoming safe places to go, not to die, but to get better, have surgery done on you. The basic sciences uh, were being developed and understood, that is pathology, bacteriology, micro, um, microbiology, bio, or chemistry, et cetera. And specialization was occurring, uh, that is, the, people who were finding they could make money by going into, say, pediatrics alone instead of doing general practice or taking care of women's diseases or surgery. So specialization. All of this around the time of, uh, that we're talking about here, around 1900. So it's like you have a foot in the old and a foot in the new. And here's this guy who's a homeopath who one of the tenets of homeopathy is like cures like. You give somebody the, the, um, a medicine that causes the same symptoms as you have, and you'll get better, like cures like. And the other um, basic tenet of homeopathy is infinitesimal doses. The smaller the dose, the more powerful it is. Totally opposite from the way we would, um, science would think about medicine or uh, uh, medi medications. But those were the ideas. And uh, in some ways, doing less was like doing more in those days. If you didn't hurt the patient, um, that was good. And homeopathy was um, perhaps the lesser of two evils. But regular medicine was progressing, as all of these uh, uh, indicators would show. So here's Randall moving out to a place practicing homeopathy, and he had a good reception for it. But at the same time, we have regular docs doing their thing and accepting these new ideas. OK, so what was it like there, moving out to the frontier? Montana was uh, a mining state. It was. Um, a timber state. It was an agricultural state. The eastern part of Montana is pretty much Great Plains with a few mountain ranges in them. And the western third is Rocky Mountains. The Continental Divide goes um, down along this western part. Um, Yellowstone Park is right here if you've been to Yellowstone. And Glacial Park is way up at the top there on, at the Canadian border. Both in the Rocky Mountains. And that's the part that most people, when they think of Montana, that's what they think of, are the, the Rockies, the mountains. So it was a new state. It was a geographical frontier. It was, in a way, the Wild West. There were uh, cattle raising and cattle rustling and um, outlaws. And I mean, all the things that you think of when you think of the Old West was there. But it was also like Missoula was a growing city that was trying to modernize and get rid of that image. So here's, um, here's a letter from Reverend Wright, this 25-year-old, to his buddy. And he says, Missoula has at least 8,000 people. This is called the Garden City of Montana. If any place is warm in Montana, by the way, um, it's Missoula. It's, it is called, still called the Garden City because it's slightly warmer than other parts of the state. Fruit and berries grow in abundance. The nights and mornings are cool always. The days never as bad as in the east. Altitude 3,145 feet. Um, it's surrounded by mountains, so you don't have to go much to get up in higher elevations, but it's in a bowl. 
Um, no dirty mines or smelters, because there was you know, lots of mining around there. Um, so to further lure Randall to Montana, um, Ernest Wright wrote, my, but won't we have some great larks in old Montana? Did you ever hunt bears? There are lots of them in the mountains near here. And a furrier in my church told me yesterday that there were lots of them being killed this year. Maybe we will have a ch get a chance. Fishing is famous about here too, you know. You know, a river runs through it. The famous book, that's Missoula. Nice thing was, he was purchasing a practice, so he wouldn't be starting cold um, trying to find new patients. So he had that uh, opportunity. So, you know, try to imagine why would you move from a practice you already have and you're doing okay to this place that's sort of unknown. And this is what's going on sort of under the surface. So Randall's friend, uh, uh, Reverend Wright, explains um, in a letter that it's a really good deal, that uh, the practice reaches up the, the Bitterroot Valley and all around the country, and Glasgow was willing to sell his horse and buggy to him as well as his office furniture. And then he says, the ranchers and farmers pay in cash a great deal. Don't think of the country work here like that of Wisconsin. You said you were not fitted for that. The farmers are a different class. You will get along with them okay. Glasgow wanted Randall to come. That is, Glasgow was the um, physician who was selling his practice. Wanted him to come uh, a month or so before Glasgow left so that he could introduce him to his patients, which was very nice of him. And he, Glasgow, this departing physician, writes to Randall and says, you will make good money from the time you start in here. This month, so far, I have taken in, in cash, $562. Of course, this is an exceptionally good month, but since January, there have been only one month that receipts fell below $400, and then only a few dollars. One little sticking point, he would, that is, uh, Randall would have to pass the state licensure exam. But Dr. Glasgow said that he could help. It turned out that Glasgow was on the board of medical examiners and offered to help him pass the exam. Um, at this early stage in Montana's medical professional history, not all the new science subjects were included on the licensing exam. So um, it's not like today where everything is much more closely regulated and national. This was uh, small. So Glasgow writes, you don't have to study chemistry, histology, pathology, or bacteriology, as we don't examine in them. There are only 10 subjects, and it's a very fair exam. I'll be able to give you two weeks quiz on the various subjects before we travel to Helena for the exam. He was going to ride with him to Helena to the, uh, uh, take the exam. I have no old copies of the exam, as they are put on the blackboard, so the examiners would write the exam questions on the blackboard, um, and only one copy gets saved, so there were no records. I don't have any records of what old exams uh, looked like from there. Randall was pretty conscientious, conscientious though, and very practical, and explained um, to his mother I have 4,000 things to see to besides preparing for the Montana State Licensing Exam. But as Dr. Glasgow examines in six subjects, those six I'll be all right in. And I'm going to put my time in on the other four, so I'll have them up in first class shape. So he was conscientious about it. It all worked out well. Randall bought the practice for 500 bucks, bought the horse and buggy and equipment from Glasgow, he passed the boards, no surprise there. Um, loved Montana, wrote a diary just a year or two later about a long hunting trip that he took um, to a nearby lake, and became a prominent member of the Missoula medical and civic community. 
practiced there until 1940. So why move to a place like this? That's the first part, getting there. So that's part one. This is a, a bit abbreviated, but um, I hope you get a, a sense of what this is about. So now part two, and this is, we're going to shift to a different part of the state because I came across a series of letters to a guy named Charles McNulty, a practicing physician in uh, the Madison and Jefferson River Valleys in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, so that's down here in the Virginia City area down this way. Here's uh, Bozeman is here, Yellowstone here. So this is very mountainous, very um, mining-ish, lots of mines there, and closed in, lots of steep valleys, as opposed to Missoula, which is in the mountains but in a big bowl um, with wide valleys. This is not that way. So here's a picture of Dr. McNulty. He, um, his home base was Virginia City. He was married to Flora McKay uh, for about five years. She went to med school, um, but seems not to have practiced. I have no information about her as a practitioner, just that she went to medical school. McNulty, just to give you the, po the, the end of his life, and then I'll come back and do some of the letters that I came across. He practiced in other cities in the uh, eight, late 1890s and early 1900s, and then it appears he committed suicide in 1904, shot himself in the heart. He was found in a hotel room in a little town called Harlem, Montana in 1904. Um, no understanding of what was going on with him, um, at least not that I could find. So the letters that I came across are from around the area, um, mostly between Ennis, um, Ennis, so there's Bozeman where you would fly into today, you use Yellowstone. Ennis is a big uh, fishing area of Montana. Lots of great trout streams. Here's Virginia City and there's Sheridan. So it's this area right in here that he practiced in. And here it is again on the topographical map. So um, the letters came uh, from a lot of the folks who lived there. Um, and you can learn a lot about what it was like to be a rural doc at that time. I'm going to frame my discussion around communication and transportation. So these were horse and buggy days. And um, I gave a talk of, a couple of years ago about the country doctor. And some of these slides may look familiar, just a couple of them. But I just want to remind you. So no, this area did not have telephones, although telephones were around in some of the towns, larger towns in Montana. They were not available here, so no phones. And the way to get around was um, with horse and buggy or horse, horseback, and telegrams and mail were the ways that you communicated. If you didn't just hire somebody or get one of your family members to go find the doctor. How do you announce that you're, uh, you have a sick person or you are sick yourself? So if you live in town, you can go to the doctor's office, talk to the doctor personally, or leave a note. Um, that would be easy. But in a small, in an area, rural or frontier area, that wasn't so easy. So you'd have to send someone to the doctor's office with a message, mail a message to the doctor, or as I said, send a telegram. So I came across probably 50 or 75 letters, um, not 50 probably, and I'm, I've selected a few um, and I've set them up in levels of urgency, okay? So here's the first one which I titled, Come Now, a telegram, 1898, from another doctor in Ennis, which was 
about 20 miles away, but in a, a long, steep grade away. And it said, Tom Farrell, badly hurt by blow on head, come to Ennis at once. So Virginia City to Ennis. Um, you have to use your imagination and imagine what it would be like then to get there. It's a long ride over hilly, hilly and mountainous terrain. And if you didn't use a horse, if you were in horse and buggy, that would make it even more difficult. So that's the most urgent. Telegram, come now, few details, just get over here and help out. Then there's the come, or please come. So this is a, from a man, uh, Wallace Green, in Ennis also, worried about his mother. He says, please come out to Varney and Yarrow Ranch tomorrow morning, Sunday, as my mother is sick. I do not quite know what you would call the sickness, but think it is a female disorder settled in the foot. How that came about, I have no idea. <laughs> her foot was up above her ankle. Her foot up above her ankle is swelled very bad and looks red and hot. She cannot use it at all. By the way, you can save 10 miles by crossing the river at Macaulay Ranch. Be sure and come. Uh, P.S. Bring stuff to put on the foot. So he's giving him a hint about how to get there so he can get there faster. Take this shortcut, because he figured that the, the doctor wasn't that familiar with these the back roads that well. OK. So another letter, another come letter. Mom is getting better. Uh, this is from Sally Freeman in Sheridan, Montana, which is so Ennis is uh, east, Sheridan is west of Virginia City where the doctor lived. My mother is considerably better. We think the medicine has done her a great deal of good and we want some more. The only thing that is causing us any anxiety is that she has such dreadful nights. The fever raises and she cannot sleep. Her cough is much worse at night, seems loose. We would feel easier if you would come down and see her because you could see a change. Come if possible and as soon. Or send medicine, but would rather you come. So sort of requesting, but some urgency there. Okay, so here's another one. Meadow Creek is, is up north and in the very uh, hinterland. My wife is quite sick and has severe pain in her head, stomach, and bowel, sick at the stomach and kind of sinking spells, and feels like she was partially paralyzed all over, has been dizzy for several days, has been able to be up until today. She has not been able to sit up any now. If you can prescribe for her, I hope you will do so. And if you think it is necessary for you to make a visit, I want you to come at once. If you send medicine, try and have it come by the next mail and oblige. Any thoughts so far about these letters? Anything that you see that you would want to comment on? Tom? Uh, yeah, I guess one thing. Uh, was there good financial opportunities in going to Montana? Would that be the, I mean, if these guys are making four to five hundred dollars <coughs> Is that right? You know that. Me? You know that. That it was I, twice. I know Major yeah. Baseball sellers, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, so it gets on the license. So it seems like a lot of money. Okay. So the question is, is, um, I can, I can <coughs> the question is, is, um, is there a lot of money to be made um, moving out to Montana? Because um, the guy in Missoula was making several hundred dollars a month. Well, uh, 400 was minimum, 550 was a good month. So let's say I, 5,000 was conceivable, unless he's gilding the lily by trying to get Yeah, trying to get him to there. move out there. So um, I honestly don't know whether this, whether because this guy was a homeopath and therefore was uh, unique and, and had a unique clientele that would allow him to make that much money, 
A lot of physicians at that time didn't do very well because yep. the competition was, was pretty keen. So, so that was exceptional. That wasn't but that. this was a capitalistic opportunity for that guy to move there. Right, I, right. I think that was plus the sense of adventure of moving out to a... Well, if you're practicing in Wisconsin and you have fairly nice transportation and developed cities and all that, and judging... Um, Sorry. I didn't mean to... Yeah. I really was... Like, uh, right, well, you know, I mean, I hope I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm doing what you want me to do, right? Ask no, questions? No, you're not. Yeah. What I want is oh. comments about this, these letters oh, oh, here, not so much oh, those first oh, ones. Oh, oh, and let me come back to that. I beg your pardon. That's okay. I wasn't specific. What I wondered was, do the letters from these patients somehow, is there any connection that you can make? Yeah. Well, today they're somewhat like what you get on a dispatch for an EMS run or sometimes what you'll get as a radio Oh, report. sorry, Melissa. So this is crazy. So they're trying to, to communicate this. as they understand. They'd be kind of comparable today to what you get on dispatch or sometimes the radio report. Uh -huh. uh, they are trying to communicate what, what and how they perceive the illness to be right. in the best way they can. Okay, they're doing the they're doing the diagnosing. Patients are saying this is what's wrong, and please prescribe if you can, um, or come and help. But yeah. Um, it's almost blind the way these letters are set up. If you can prescribe for her, I hope you will. Um, but if you have to come, you know, okay, come. But we'd like, like you to help in some way. Um, so it's a different kind of, of medicine from the kind of medicine that we're used to today. And maybe I'll come back. Maybe I've jumped in too soon to getting everyone involved here. Let me, I'll go on a little bit more, read a few more letters, and then we can have more conversation. So here's another one. Sir, would you be so kind as to send me by the first coach some more medicine, as Mr. Craig is away on a roundup, and I have no magnesia since Saturday. Magnesia, I believe, was for constipation, et cetera, that sort of thing. I could not get any as they do not keep it at Ennis. Your last medicine didn't do me any good, only the magnesia, and I would like some more, and any other medicine you think best, as I am getting uneasy about myself, as my stomach is as bad as ever. And it's from Mrs. Craig. Uh, and it says, please leave the medicines at, um, at Mr. Oliver's. So please leave the medicine somewhere else. Okay, and then another series of letters, tell me what's wrong and send medicine. I have been sick for over one year, have swelling in my limbs and shortness of breath. Some think I have asthma. I'm also troubled with my stomach. Wish you to send me some medicine and send charges and we'll send you the money and oblige. Um, and one last one and then I'll get a little bit more uh, a little bit different into personal stories. Sir, will you please send me some medicine to bring my courses regular? Anybody know what that is? That's menstruation. Yeah. So get my courses regular. I'm not menstruating regularly. I caught cold and stopped them. I've been sick with the headache. If you don't send something that will start them right away, don't send anything. Please do at my request and send to Anna's post office. Okay. So now some uh, personal stories and requests. So here's a particularly poignant one. This is from Mrs. Berger, who was a neighbor of J.W. Hageman from Bear Creek, Montana. And all it says is 1889, February the 13th, Dr. McNulty, our little girl died the 13th of February. Please advertise, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. J.W. Hageman on Bear Creek. Her name was Gracie A. Hageman. So that's what they, the Hagemans got Mrs. Berger to write to 
Dr. McNulty. On that same sheet of paper, written sideways in a different handwriting, was the following. And this is probably what appeared in the paper. Died Hageman at Bear Creek, Madison County, Montana, on Wednesday, February 13th, 1889, of capillary bronchitis. Gracie A., daughter of Mr. and Mrs. J.W. Hageman, age about three years. So somehow either McNulty went out there or got some other information from Mrs. Berger um, and filled in some of the details. And then my favorite. Doctor, I would like to obtain the address of the druggist and name of those sex pills which I have been getting from you that I may send for them when wanted. That's letter one. Letter two. Find enclosed note one dollar, a note, a bank note for one dollar, for which send me some of those pills, aphrodisiac. <laughs> Don't matter about the amount being on hand. Send what you have and get more. I lost all but half a dozen or so in unpacking my trunk. Anyways, I can't find them. You told me of a wash that would prevent females from pregnation if properly used. Won't you please give me the proportions? It will be entirely private with me. P.S. Please put this in the stove and don't mention it <laughs> to any friends. Obviously, he didn't do that, and I did not include the man's name. Yes, I did include the man's name. <laughs> you didn't see the man's name, and you don't know who Thomas White from Butte, Montana is anyway, right? Um, just interesting. And one more. This is from a guy who moved to Helena from Virginia City area. Your bill came to hand in due time, but sickness in my family prevented me from replying sooner. We have had a terrible time since we came over and have missed you very much. Came over to Helena. All the children have had scarlet fever and measles. The expense and doctor's bills have been so high I am drained of money, and it would be a favor if you could wait on me for, for your bill. I am saved up a little. I will try and arrange it at the beginning of the year. And usually you didn't get paid as a physician until after the harvest towards the uh, end of the, around Christmas time or the first of the coming year. So, um, but this is a, a special plea for some sympathy and uh, help in uh, not requiring the bill to be paid right away. So those are a sample of some of the letters from this very rural, almost frontier part of Montana, a little bit different from the John Getty's Randall area. And now I'm going to finish up with um, a, a one more little piece. And this is from Fergus County, uh, which is newest town in the central part of the state. Uh, it's there are mountains around here, but it's mostly on the plains. And uh, Lewistown was a, a, a town. I mean, it was settled and uh, had a, not as big as Missoula, but it had a, a, a nice population. And I want to make two points um, about this now. So we've got physicians moving into the state, some reputable, and I would say that uh, John Geddes Randall was reputable, even though homeopathy was on its way out by 1910, 1920. But there were lots of opportunists who also moved into the state. How do you uh, keep the profession credible when you have folks who are moving there who are opportunists, maybe don't even have medical degrees? Um, and one way to do that is to make sure that they're qualified. And the way you make sure they're qualified is that you organize your doctors who are consider themselves legitimate doctors and require you to pass a licensure exam. And that's what 
um, Fergus County established a medical society in 1901 to try to get rid of charlatans, what they, the regular docs considered charlatans. And they petitioned the state medical society to please enforce the rules about pra practicing, practicing without a license. Because it was in a rural uh, state like this, it was hard to enforce a lot of the rules. So that was one thing that happened, uh, was that medical societies were formed to help physicians, regular physicians, maintain their status in the society. The other thing that physicians did was to establish what, came, came, what were known as fee bills. And this is um, from that same Fergus County Medical Society. This is 1905, a few years after the society was formed. And what they would do would be to get together and establish a, a rate chart and say, we, are, we agree, all the doctors of Fergus County agree that we will charge this much money for these uh, procedures or whatever was needed, medical uh, things. There's a lot, this is a much longer uh, document than this. <clears throat> but for a historian, it's great because it tells you what they thought they could do, what the doctors think they could do. It also said, and also how much they would charge, and it also provided uh, an opportunity for physicians to ex exclude those who charged less. So if you had a guy, um, and it was mostly guys, although there were some women who moved to Montana as well, who charged less, tried to get the pra practice of the local folks by charging less money, um, the regular docs could say, hey, you're not, you're not a real doctor. You're not a, a regular practitioner. You don't belong because you didn't subscribe to our fee bill. And all the docs who subscribed to it agreed that they would only charge a certain amount of money. So these were ways that the profession organized. Fee bills go way back. This is, Montana is not unique. If you look in Virginia, back in the 1700s, you'll see fee bills um, because that same issue was there at that time. That is, who's a real doctor and who's, a, uh, who's not. So what I've tried to do is to give you a sense of what 1900, that's just not that long ago, what medicine uh, in a new area of the country that was just being settled would have been like, what drew people to the place, what it was like to practice there, and how the, the, the physicians could organize themselves into uh, society. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and see if you have questions or comments. Um. If you have not signed in, please do with Kathy in the back. We've got refreshments. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. The reason is that we want to get both the question and Todd's comments and answers on the, on the, uh, uh, the tape, on the recording. It's not for amplification. There's no, we're not amplifying the sound here. <laughs> so, okay. Gentleman way in the back was first. Todd, I was curious about trains. Uh, yes. Did uh, Randall take a train from from Wisconsin to Missoula? Or? Probably, yes, he did. In fact, I know he did, yes. Trains were the mode of transportation, and it's really what helped make Montana were trains, because getting, it's called the treasure state, the mineral state, and it was a way of getting uh, those minerals out. So yeah, there were, uh, trains were very important. Uh, that previous slide you had up, I'm very curious about that. With, um, yeah, a physical exam, uh, 25 to to $100, that's, I mean, that's a lot of money. Yes, it uh, is. I'm very surprised that they were charging that much back then. Consuming considerable time and requiring use of mechanical aid to diagnosis. So I think that is a an exceptionally Law, big exam. I don't know that the whole concept of the physical was um, 
the way we think of it today, I don't know that that's what uh, most people have, but for a big exam, you know, a thorough exam, I guess, to tell you the truth, I, I don't really know what, uh, what they would have done, what exactly if a full physical in 1900 would have been. So it's a, a good question. And it is a lot of money, yeah. Well, I have actually two questions. Uh, one is, can you give us an idea as the number of practitioners, say, for a population of this town? Is it one in a thousand, one in five thousand? Okay. So in Missoula, where Randall moved, he was the only homeopath. And um, there were probably ten or twelve regular docs in a town of eight, ten thousand people. This was... Um, just before medical education um, became uh, science-oriented, science the so-called Flexner era. And so um, most towns, if you look in um, medical directories of the time, most towns had a doctor, even the teeniest little town, even in Montana, had at least one physician, uh, if not two or three. So. To have eight or ten in Missoula was a pretty good number. Um, yeah. And the other question I had is just because it's so much a frontier. Uh, let's say at 1905, uh, radiation X-rays had been around for about ten years. Uh, were the facilities like electricity available for physicians to have that service? <laughs> um, so there were, um, electricity was introduced and available in the cities. M people out in the country m might have had, that's what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Folks out in the country might not have had uh, access to electricity or running toilets, running water, that sort of thing. Um, but. The hot, there were hospitals, like Missoula had a couple of hospitals at that time, and a railroad hospital, actually. The, uh, there was a big railroad hospital in, in Missoula at that time. Um, so the contrast between the rural areas and the urban, uh, so, sort of urban areas. Helena was the big city, uh, and that's hard to imagine because most people have never even heard of Helena today, and yet... So th does that kind of get at what you're, yeah? Todd, how popular were, how many people would have had uh, a place where they could send a telegraph? Uh, there must have been lots of people said, you know, settled out in places that didn't have telegraphs. No, they didn't. They had to send letters. They would just send a family member with a scrawled letter to the, ta to the doc. And to find the doc, you just leave, you'd have to leave the note at the doctor's office because you didn't know where the doctor was since house calls were the, the norm then. The doctor probably wasn't even in the office seeing patients. But in some cases, people might have had to go some distance to find to get a telegram. If you needed office. to send a telegram, yes, you would have to go to Virginia City or any of the, the towns, uh, yeah. So that's why people would generally just send, send a family member or something. Dr. Papalos. Yeah. Uh, this is more in the nature of um, a comment than a question, uh, but uh, Sinclair Lewis wrote two novels uh, about, uh, right around that same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Aerosmith and then Main Street. Main Street, uh, main character was a, a doctor practicing in the small town. Aerosmith practiced briefly uh, in, in this kind of environment, but as you, were, as you were showing these letters and talking about it, it brought to mind several incidents in these novels, yeah. based, of course, upon uh, <clears throat> Sinclair Lewis's father, who was a 
practicing physician in neighboring North Dakota about right. this time. Yes, yeah, and in fact, I've used Aerosmith in um, medical history classes just because it gives it the, a good sense of what medicine was like at the time. Well, thank you all for coming. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, one more. Uh, just curious about uh, the typical practice where, where they you mention house calls. Would they have a regular schedule and say do house calls on Tuesday and then office hours on Monday or Wednesdays they, or something like that? They had regular um, hours, but they were daily hours. So you would always, you in the newspapers, there would be a, a, a small box ad and it would say office hours, and usually they were morning, afternoon, and sometimes evening. And in between, they would make house calls. So your office hours might be 8 to 10 in the morning, and then from 10 to 12, you might go make house calls. This is in a town now. And then uh, have lunch, and then come back, and have more office hours, and then uh, go out and make house calls. The thing is, out like with uh, McNulty, I don't think he had regular hours, the, the guy in Virginia City. I could see Randall in Missoula having regular, somewhat regular hours, and he did. But um, there's that letter that says, don't worry about the country practice also. Um, he was used to in, in, that's a good question. I'll have to think about the, um, what, what the difference was when he moved to Missoula. Because he did go up and down the Bitterroot Valley and saw patients all over. How about time off? Did they have days where they didn't practice at all? I have, it's a, a really good question, and I had never seen that. I mean, you were expected in church on Sunday, but if you were out on a call, you'd, my guess is they didn't have office hours on Sundays, but that you were at the beck and call of your clients of your patients so yeah it would have been a hard I mean nowadays it's so you know most doctors see patients only in the office and it makes it a whole lot easier not that it's easy to be I mean you're still busy um, but imagine making house calls and all the time involved in that Time is a big issue. No matter what, doctor's time was a big issue. Whether you were out making calls, do you charge for the time going to somebody's house? How much do you charge? Does that count? How do you make a living? Um, as opposed to the, having patients come to your office, it's much more efficient. Uh, so time has always been an issue with physicians. It's a good, good question. Okay, I think we're finished. Um, and thank you very much, Todd. Thank you.